in continuing with the inquiry on reincarnationism, or what's called the doctrine of reincarnation in religious systems, there's a good resource entitled Reincarnation in Christianity, a new role or a new vision of the role of rebirth in Christian thought. Author Geddes McGregor. Is there room for the concept of rebirth in Christian dogma? The question that bothered Dr. McGregor was a quite basic. Can a Christian believe in reincarnation and still remain loyal to the Bible and church? He researched it into the annals of Christian history, cut through centuries of religious emotionalism, and reported his findings in this landmark work, Reincarnation in Christianity, a vision of the role of rebirth in Christian thought. So the question that remains is reincarnation incompatible with Christian thought. Preface Reincarnation is one of the most fascinating ideas in the history of religion, as it is also one of the most recurrent themes in the lit literature of the world. It is widely assumed to be foreign to the Christian heritage, and especially alien to the Hebrew roots of biblical thought. That assumption is questionable. This book is developed for the general reader out of the Burke's lectures. I delivered at McGill University, says Geddes McGregor, entitled The Christianing of Karma. It is an inquiry, certainly not a polemic for or against reincarnationism, but rather an open-minded approach. Evidence does exist to suggest that the notion is incompatible with Judaism and Christianity. But if you look further into these traditions, you'll find that it is indeed common to both traditions in their history and their writings. Other evidence, however, may be adduced to support the view that a form of it might even be a doctrine within the apostolic tradition, the recovery of which could be essential to the plentitude of the Christian faith, if in the one case presumably the faithful should be warned against it, you know, they have. In the other case, the rehabilitation of the doctrine would seem to be a matter of urgency, more likely and surely exciting enough would be the conclusion, if warranted, that a form of reincarnationism, perhaps such as some of the early fathers called Medan somatosis might be a viable option for those who seeking to be faithful to Christian orthodoxy look to the Bible as their primary warrant and to church tradition as their guide to its interpretation. This book is an inquiry into the grounds, if any, on which such a conclusion might be legitimately reached.
reached, though I do not obtrude my personal sympathies, neither do I disguise them, since some readers will be interested in the idea of reincarnationism for its own sake. A bibliography partially annotated is provided from author Geddes McGregor. And now a, a brief reading from a section in chapter one of the book that hits on some philosophical and scientific points. Quote, the modern philosophical and scientific objections to the classic presentations of reincarnationism is indeed formidable. We shall consider them in a special chapter, first let us ask wherein lies the peculiar appeal to the notion that one's life is but one of a series, it is a notion that is entertained even by many who do not take much interest in religious ideas and to whom other doctrines, whether of immortality or of resurrection, mean little or nothing. Why? should it so captivate even those who seem to be conceptually least prepared for it. I ask the reader to be peculiarly clear on one point in presenting the following eight considerations as among the most telling. I am not suggesting that they should compel e either denial or assent. At this stage, we are less concerned with the truth of the notion than with its meaning. We should first see what that notion means, then whether it is plausible as it is intelligible. We may then go on to assess any plausibility that we may find in it. First, then... The notion is more satisfying to many people, both morally and intellectually, than is any proposal that appears to entail an arbitrary divine judgment, such as conscious eternal torment and all of its variations of a hell. Karma is automatic. There is no arbitrariness or subjectivity in it that does not necessarily exclude, though historically it has often done so, the notion of mercy, grace, and forgiveness. God might be seen as finding ways of overcoming the moral law of karma as he is seen by some to find ways of overcoming nature not by destroying or injuring it, but by going beyond our apprehension of it. Karma, with, which is intelligible to the human mind by analogy with scientific laws, could be seen as providing the basis, as does the Torah, of the ways of God to man. The natural sciences, such as physics, chemistry help us to understand the way things are so the cosmic moral law or universal laws of karma might be seen to help us to understand how things are in the moral order. The learned may call this way of looking at things neo-gnostic but while it certainly can be developed along Gnostic lines, and very often indeed has been so developed in the history of human thought so as to preclude the exercise of God's will and the operation of his love. It need not be so developed. It can stand while allowing room for the surprising acts of God. So, while it may not be indigenous to those 
religions that stress the will of God acting freely in history, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. It need not be wholly incompatible with them. An analogy might be drawn from our attitude to the sciences. What physicists and chemists and biologists say may be interpreted nihilistically, but it need not be, as it need not exclude the possibility of a theistic interpretation, neither need a karmic view of the moral realm exclude an Orthodox or Jewish or Muslim view of the sovereignty of God's will. Second, reincarnation accords well with much that we now know about evolution in the world of biology and physics. The notion that the struggle for biological development as a counterpart in the struggle for moral development is at least plausible, as some of the early evolutionists saw their discovery as a tooth and claw principle, the survival of the fittest, so the karmic principle may be interpreted as a struggle for the development of a might is right sort of moral power, but it need not be. It need no more be so interpreted than must religion, which ideologically begins as a primitive fear. Be uh, precluded from eventually transcending that fear. Third, the notion that we, we reap what we sow be it now or in a trillion lives later, is eminently congenial to those who attach importance to the notion of human freedom of choice, for while the karmic principle is an inexhaustible, as inexhaustible as are the laws of physics and genetics, we are by no means to be seen as helplessly imprisoned in its clutches. On the contrary, we create our own karma by our own acts. Karma is the given, as Sarte calls the state of affairs we encounter in human life. And our task is to extricate ourselves from it, as in the great prison motif of modern existentialism by surrounding, surmounting it, and so creating new and hopefully better karma. I have created the prison from which I must now extricate myself. Fourth, the universality of the notion in history of religion is not a negligible element in its appeal to thoughtful and educated people. Again, that does not mean that it need be the last word in the history of religious ideas. Nevertheless, no serious and historically minded student of religion will lightly write it off, as do some. At least it must have expressed something important in the religious consciousness of humankind, if it is to be accounted outmoded what precisely takes its place. Whatever that is alleged to be, does it effectively encompass and supersede the allegedly outmoded notion of reincarnation? If not, how can one call reincarnation an entirely outmoded notion? Fifth, all the ancient myths, both of immortality and of resurrection, seem to be expressible in the myth of reincarnation. As we shall consider, purgatory is strikingly conformable to reincarnationist teaching. The whole process of 
spiritual evolution can be seen as purgative. I am purged of whatever it was that has bound me to my old karma. The purgation is painful, the release blissful, yet the bliss cannot be greater than the capacity for bliss that I have attained. Thomas Aquinas, the most influential of the medieval schoolmen, saw that clearly in his own way and dealt with it skillfully. He was confronted by a medieval type of question that we might express as follows, quote, Heaven is supposed to be a state of perfect happiness, but some people in heaven are the greatest saints who ever lived, while others have only scraped into heaven by the skin of their teeth. If then I, being of the latter class, see myself alongside a Francis of Assisi or a Martin of Tours, knowing them to be such holier and therefore happier than I can ever be, how can I be fully happy? Thomas answered that the beautified in heaven are like cups of various sizes, each cup brimful, so that even if mine be the smallest cup in heaven, it is nevertheless as full as it can be. I am therefore as happy as I can be, and not even Peter or Paul could do better than that. It is like having as much food as you can eat, having a small stomach. You have enough to fill it. You are as fully fed as anyone. Sixth, the reincarnationism exalts the individual. In the classic priestly traditions of the great institutional religions, the Bra Brahma Brahmacal, Jewish and Christian, the emphasis has been on community, covenant, and other such notions that exalt the institution and its functionaries. Buddhism, which became, as did Christianity, a great international religion transcending blood and soil, ideas which is always much stress karmic and other reincarnationist ideas began as a protest of the individual against institutionalism. My karma is peculiar to me. It is my problem, and the triumph over it is my triumph. I may need to help. I may need the help of teachers. I may even profit from my belongingness, but in the last resort, I am responsible for what I am, as I am becoming responsible for what I shall be. As I struggle through my predicament, you may laugh at my antics as you will, but he who laughs last, laughs best. In the long run, my joy shall be commensurate with the anguish of my present strife. You are seeing an individual in the making, and there is no grander spectacle in all the universe of finite being. Seventh, and by no means least, reincarnationism takes care of the problem of moral injustice. To the age-old question of Job, why do the wicked prosper and the religious or righteous suffer? The reincarnationist has a ready answer. We are seeing in this life only a fragment of a long story. If you come in at the chapter in which the vellum beats the hero to a pulp, of course you will ask the old question. You may even put down the book at that point and join forces with those who call life absurd, seeing no justice whatsoever in the universe. That is because you are too impatient to go on to hear the rest of the story, which will unfold as a richer pattern which the punishment of the wicked and the vindication of the righteous 
will be brought to light. Death is but the end of a chapter. It is not, as the nihilists suppose, the end of the story. Yet even now, we can already see here and there a glimmer of the process. He has put down the mighty from their seat and has exalted the humble. These joyful words attributed, attributed in the Magnificat to the Virgin Mary are words we easily understand because despite our lamentations with Job as at the injustice of the world, we have seen in our own brush with human history some something of the truth of her joyful proclamation. Eighth, almost everybody experiences from time to time the sudden and sometimes eerie sense of deja vu of having been here before. In a poem entitled Pre-Existence, Frances Concord sees herself lying on the seashore dreaming. How all of this had been before, how ages far away I lay on some forgotten shore, as here I lay today, the waves came shining up the stands, as here today they shine, and in my pre Placidian hands, the stand was warm and fine. You travel to a distant country whose history and civilization are strikingly alien to your background and education. Suppose you are a Norwegian visiting Turkey or a Finn in Morocco. Suddenly, you feel as though long ago you had seen it all before. Some people have no particular linguistic facility, have found that a particular language comes to them as if it were their forgotten maternal tongue, though that is historically impossible in terms of all they know. Suppose you have never been able to make headway in any foreign language, yet when having gone to Italy, you find Italian comes to you easily, or even having traveled to India, you suddenly find yourself curiously able to pick up and acquire fluency in Hindi or Tamil. No genetic or historical or sociological explanation satisfactorily accounts for any of these experiences. Attempts at psychological explanation of this deja vu phenomenon seem to be inadequate, where they resort to a theory such as Jung's collective unconscious, the presuppositions on which they rely no more empirically verifiable or falsifiable than are the reincarnational hypothesis they are brought in to replace. While no assent, compelling proof can be offered that these experiences refer to some background from a previous incarnation, the experiences are peculiarly significant to those who, for other reasons, are disposed to take reincarnationist theory seriously. The appeal of the myth of reincarnation cuts across race, color, and creed, except to the extent that the body of accepted dogma is believed to exclude it. To some extent, it also even bridges the gulf between belief and unbelief. Even the least religious people find that it makes sense whether they are inclined to believe it or not. While the most thoughtful and sensitive among the religious are the least disposed to reject it out of hand. Such a notion surely merits close inspection, not least since it is conformable 
to either of two rival historically important theories about an afterlife, according to one of these mainstreams in the history of religious ideas, the essential part of man, his ego, or self, or soul, is in, in many ways immortal, unlike the body which dies like any other animal body, the human soul being somehow or other of divine origin, perhaps even a spark of the divine fire, as is immortal, as is the source of the universe itself. The doctrine, familiar to students of Plato and Plotinus, has influenced Christianity, hence the notion that, a, that at death man must go somewhere, be it heaven or hell, purgatory, for he cannot die. <clears throat> at least that is the idea carried forth. Against this view is another, according to which man has no such entitlement to immortality, but may be resurrected to new life. In Christianity, this seems clearly to be the Pauline view. Man is in a state of sin, and sin normally entails death. Nevertheless, through participation in the resurrection of Christ, man can be raised with him to eternal life. Such a resurrection doctrine, though less commonly associated with reincarnationism, than is the other immortality doctrine, might be even more compatible with it. Resurrection to a new Sama, a glorified body, why should not this be another incarnation on this planet or some other far off in outer space? Reincarn or reincarnation, whatever else it may be, means resurrection of some kind. So the notion that resurrection and reincarnation have nothing in common is perhaps a false assumption. The attainment of a glorified body might be through a gradual process. The fact that the reincarnationist myth can sit with either of these two historic understandings of the nature of human destiny does not mean that either or both must entail it. It does mean that those who reject it should have a good reason for doing so. And because my pastor says so is not a very good reason. One must investigate these premises for oneself to find any conclusive answers. At least that is the hope and recommendation. Closer inspection will reveal that the theological reasons usually adduced are too feeble to carry much weight. Too often, indeed, they reflect misunderstanding of the meaning of reincarnational doctrine. And many reject it right out of hand based on a misunderstanding. The role of karma and the nature of samsara, or chain of rebirths, in which the karmic principle issues. Unquote. In Reincarnation in Christianity, a new vision of the role of rebirth in Christian thought. Emeritus Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at the University of Southern California, Dr. Geddes McGregor, was a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and a recipient of the California Literature Award. 
came to the U.S. in 1949 as the first holder of the Rufus Jones Chair in Philosophy and Religion at Brian Moore. Dr. McGregor was the author of over 20 books in this particular one. stands out among the many. Timothy Cardinal Manning, Archbishop of Los Angeles, Professor McGregor's exciting thesis challenges our traditional orthodoxy. So those that don't wish to be challenged, I wouldn't recommend this material if you've already made up you know, your mind about this doctrine because it seems to be resurfacing throughout time and history probably for various reasons if not it being an actual fact is it merely a belief? perhaps, perhaps not maybe it's just a fact maybe it's just the process of how things happen and of course between lives and in new lives we don't necessarily remember our past lives although there is such a thing as past life regression whether or not any of this has validity it's up to the researcher and investigator into these things Nevertheless, it's encouraged that you research the subject yourself and just don't take anyone's word for it. Decide for yourself whom or what you should believe concerning faith, religion, or doctrines within the religions. With that said, I'll end this report and recommend the book 